Lady. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're sorry we're starting a bit late, uh, but as you can imagine, Kathmandu traffic being what it is, uh, we received word that uh, the traffic is pretty bad in the uh, Putali Sarak kind of area. So in order to allow half the Kathmandu population to reach here, we're starting late, but I guess there will be stragglers coming in. But uh, uh, we've uh, made arrangements for an, an extra screen to be put up in the other room, and they'll be able to uh, listen to the lecture from there. Uh, thank you for being at, with us this afternoon uh, of winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. I'm Deepak Thapa of Social Science Bar, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Mahesh Chandragmi Lecture of 2013. This is the 12th in the series of the lectures, and we're deeply honored to have the opportunity to welcome Dr. Vandana Shiva to deliver the lecture this year. Social Science Baha began the Mayesh Chandra Regmi Lecture as an annual event in 2003 with the consent of Mr. Regmi himself. We believe that this was one of the ways in which our society could honor the great and seminal contribution of a scholar who we can proudly say was world class. Mr. Regmi himself was present at the first lecture and the picture on the banner shows him listening to the lecture being delivered by the late Dr. Harka Gurung. Unfortunately for Nepali scholarship, Mr. Regmi passed away soon after. Since then, we've had a host of luminaries consent to honor the memory of Mahesh Chandra Regmi, and it is in this spirit that Dr. Shiva is here with us. Till some years ago, we used to list all the speakers we have had the privilege of hosting, but the list obviously gets longer every year, and so we stopped that practice a few years back. But there is one speaker I would like to mention today because, because it was only yesterday that many of us got to read in the papers that Dr. Kumar Pradhan, the eminent historian from Darjeeling, who had given the second lecture, had passed away. On behalf of Social Science Baha, I would like to express our deepest condolences to the family. Uh, some, of, uh, some house rules. Uh, could you please uh, switch off your phones or put them in silent mode so that there are no disturbances during the lecture? And we've also received uh, a number of inquiries regarding recording the uh, lecture. Uh, what I'd like to assure you is that we will have the lecture on our website, uh, both in audio and visual format. So you need not bother. Uh, we've got professionals doing the job. So you, know, you can download it from our site, or you can ask us, or whatever. So why don't you just enjoy the lecture, uh, rather than bother about whether you're getting the sound correct or not. Uh, now, I would like to invite a fellow member of the Social Science Baha, Ajay Dixit, to please introduce Dr. Vandana Shiva. Ajay Jay is a well-known water resources engineer whose latter work has focused on the issue of climate change, but he is equally, if not more so, famous as a magazine columnist as well. Ajay Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I, Deepak said, I'm a member of the Social Science Baha. I'm al I also work at Issue for Social and Environmental Transition. And I'm indeed extremely honored to be getting this opportunity and introducing Vandana. Many years ago, when I was a young engineer, 77, we used to read about you know, the activism, the questions, the challenges, uh, that came from, you know, the hills of Uttarakhand, the environmental challenges, and Vandana was one of our hero. As an engineer, I had very little understanding of those nuances that was raised in question. And as I became mature, if you will, you know, things started to become a little clear. Vandana needs no introduction, but still, as a part of this uh, 12th, Mahesh Chandra Lecture Series. Let me take this honor. Uh, Bandana is a world-renowned environmental leader and recipient of the 1993 Right Livelihood Award. It's also known as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize. Her contribution to diverse fields such as intellectual property rights, biodiversity, biotechnology, bioethics, genetic engineering, has been twofold, both at the intellectual level as well as through activist campaign. 
and then it gives me strength to say her passion, her determination and grit in tackling and dealing and challenging some of the most powerful corporations in the world. Putting in the voice of the depressed, of the voiceless, of nature, of earth, and then presenting an alternative perspective view of the world. Before be becoming an activist, Dr. Shiva was one of India's leading physicists. Formerly, she has done interdisciplinary research in science, technology, environmental policy at Indian Institute of Science and Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. She is one of the three leaders of the International Forum on Globalization. Vandana has also served as an advisor to Government of India, other governments abroad, as well as non-government organizations. She plays a major role in global eco-feminist movement. She founded the Gender Unit in our own issue mode here, International Center for Mountain Development, and was a founding board member of the Women's Environment and Development Organization. We do. Recipient of numerous awards for a service in human rights, ecology, and conservation, Time magazine identified Dr. Shiva as an environmental hero in 2003. And Asia Week has called her one of the five most powerful communicators of Asia. I'm sure we all have watched her speech in YouTube, and I'm sure we're going to enjoy and be mesmerized by what Bandana is going to tell us. She's written extensively on a variety of environmental issues and authored several best-selling books. Her recent publications include books such as Making Peace with Earth, Beyond Resource, Land, and Food Wars, 2012, Staying Alive, Women, Ecology, and Development, 2010, Soil, not oil. Environmental justice in an age of climate crisis, 2008. And earth democracy, justice, sustainability, and peace, 2005. And she has also starred in a few documentaries, such as The Dirt, the movie, 2009, and The New Rulers of the World, 2001. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me request Bandana to deliver the 12th Mahesh Chandra Regmi Lecture. Vandana. There's a little recorder here. I shouldn't move it. Yeah? Um, well, I'd like to uh, very humbly say thank you to Social Science Bahat for giving me this honor, uh, inviting me to give uh, the 12th Mahesh Chandra Rigme lecture, um, following amazing people like Eleanor Onstrom and her work on the commons, um, Andre Battelle's lecture on democracy. And, uh, and I hope I will build on what they have contributed to, because I think we are at the cusp of uh, something absolutely unprecedented, uh, both in planetary evolution as well as in human history. There have been challenges to all kinds of freedoms in the past. There have been oppressive societies and unjust societies. But three new things are happening at this point. And some of those new things are arriving at your doorstep here in Nepal too. The first is related to the work on the commons. For the first time in the history of humanity, and for the first time in evolution's history, there is the creation of a new property right in biodiversity, species, and life forms. Yeah. Property rights were created in land. 
there have been an attempt to create property rights in water, but the movements have always been strong because water has been so clearly known to be a commons. I think 90% of privatization initiatives in the world have failed in the last 10, 15 years. But the privatization of life forms, whether it is in the form of seed or medicinal plants, is a new enclosure of the biological commons. And since the planet is a web of life, this enclosure is literally an enclosure of the web itself. But the aspects of biodiversity, the aspects of living systems that have had a human co-evolution also have a deep intellectual component. So for example, my grandmother used to use neem for protecting the wheat and the woolens. Just a few leaves in the cupboards and in the bins. And in, in 1984, we had the Bhopal disaster. And I started a campaign, no more Bho Bhopal's plant to neem. I used to carry bucketfuls of saplings to Bhopal to plant neem because we knew neem controls pests. And in 94, there's a new patent on pesticide properties of neem. The first ever use of neem to control pests and a new property right. For 11 years, I had to deal with that case. And um, in 11 years, we overturned that patent, which there were many related to neem, but the one we challenged, because in a legal thing, you can't challenge to, uh, it, it. The one we challenged was one jointly held by a company called W.R. Grace, which was implicated in the toxic contamination outside Boston. And uh, some of you might be familiar with the book and the film called A Civil Action. That was W.R. Grace's injecting pollutants into the groundwater. And then it was the mothers of the children who got leukemia who did the research themselves to find out why their kids were getting leukemia and not others and they connected it, then they found this pollution. Uh, but this patent was jointly held with the USDA. 11 years, and we overturned it. Now, you know, when you come, I mean, Nepal was not colonized, uh, so you don't have the same kind of history that we do. Um, but for those of us who've lived in, former colonies, there was a particular way in which rights were created. And they were created by declaring the colonized territory as empty. Yeah? The legal category created in those times was terra nullius. So all the Aboriginal people in Australia didn't exist. Why didn't they exist? Because they were more like the fauna and flora than the, like the Europeans. So very easy to say, no one else is human if you define being human as white, Christian, male. Then everyone else becomes less than human. And if you extend that aspect of the empty land, the empty earth, where people, the Native Americans, the Africans aren't people, because the measure of what it means to be human, as I mentioned, is a very privileged European category I feel what's happening with the definition of the new property rights in life through patenting is something based on the assumption of bio nullius. Life is empty. Life is empty as long as indigenous people use it, and life is empty as long as we don't put a gene, our gene, into a plant. Then there's creation amazingly, instantaneously, an invention takes place. Millennia of evolution is erased. Thousands of years of indigenous knowledge is erased. But it's not just the past, because the beauty about living systems, particularly the seed, which has become such an inspiration for me, is the fact that it holds not just all of the past, 
all of the memory, all of the culture, all of the evolution. It holds all of the future. My doctorate work is in quantum theory, and in quantum theory, all we deal with is potential. The potential to evolve. That's the only property. There are no fixed properties of hard desks and length and breadth and the Cartesian criteria of mass and weight and dimension. The real property is quality of potential and the tendency to evolve. So, in effect, what we are really seeing happen is an erasure of the past, but an erasure and closure of the future. Now, this idea of owning life as property, owning life as creation, is based on the introduction of one kind of organism, a new kind of organism that has never existed in evolution before. Things mix in evolution. Hybrids get created. But a deliberate introduction of an unrelated gene into an organism, which is called the gen GMO, or genetically engineered organism, um, it's never happened before. You know, human genes didn't get into cows. I had to deal with a patent by Roslyn Institute, the ones who did the uh, Dolly the sheep. You remember Dolly? And you remember the Time magazine, Newsweek, Economist, every magazine cover was the creator and the created. The creator was the scientist, the created was little Dolly. And she was supposed to be a revolution. Poor Dolly is in a museum, stuffed up. She died. And the founder of Roslyn, I debated him in European Parliament in 1989. He said, there's nothing like life forms. For me, sheep are just furry little factories designed to produce chemicals we want in their mammary glands. The patent for Dolly and Tracy was mammalian bioreactors. Like nuclear reactors unleash all these chain reactions to boil water. That's what a re nuclear reactor really is. Boil water to then create steam to give you the electricity. Um, all mammals, including humans, are potential mammalian bioreactor. Well, Roslyn is closed up, Dolly is in a museum, and we get so overwhelmed with the promise of genetic engineering, uh, most people don't stop to look at the fact that about 90% promises have failed. One of the very early ones was something called the flavor saver tomato. Now, this was a tomato which was supposed to not rot. So you could actually have a rotten tomato looking fresh in a supermarket shop. That was the idea, that you wouldn't have to replenish the tomatoes. And what they'd done is reverse the aging gene. So aging wouldn't show. Of course, you can't stop the aging, but it wouldn't show just like you can't stop aging in humans. But when you Botox yourself, then the beautiful lines we should get with age get paralyzed. You know, it's, it basically causes paralysis. That's what Botox does. So I call flavor saver the Botox tomato. <laughs> and of course, nobody, I mean, there was no movement at that time in a very big way. The company that launched it was Calcalgy and then bought up by Monsanto. It failed because it's such a bad tomato. Yeah. The point with a tomato, or any food for that matter, is that it's not just what it looks like on the shelf that matters. It what it becomes while you cook that also matters. So you know the older tomatoes just disappear while cooking. Or when you eat them raw, they're so juicy. I mean, a tomato is like a rock. <laughs> it's not a very desirable cooking ingredient. And sadly, as all breeding, not just genetic engineering, all breeding is less and less and less for adaptation to ecosystems, which is why we got so much diversity, because ecosystems are so diverse. 
So India had 200,000 varieties of rice. And in the mountain systems, every level of the slope has a different rice. Because it has a different climate, a different temperature, a different sun, a different rain. And diversity then was the result of the diversity of ecological conditions. But it was also a result of the diversity of cultures. The Japanese like their sticky rice and they pick it up with chopsticks. Can you imagine what would happen to basmati with chopsticks? You'd get one grain at a time. <laughs> but in India, we like the fine grained, and therefore, Dehradun, famous basmati, that too was patented. That too we had to fight, four years, 98 onwards. They patented the length of the grain, the height of the plant, the aroma, which you, could put, you can't put in there. But what I loved best was methods of cooking. Now, as a young six-year-old, my mother, uh, grandmother had said, it's so easy, chawal banana bahut asaan hai. Seeklo. And she said, put whatever amount of rice and put that much water above it. I'm sure those of you who've been taught by mothers and grandmothers know, just that much water. And it's going to turn out a perfect rice. But even that, grandmother's knowledge didn't exist. Huh? It was invented by Rice Tech of Texas. <laughs> Interesting name, Rice Tech. Because there's an illusion that put tech against anything, you're going to be fine. <laughs> to the extent that when 2008 we had the Wall Street crisis which converted into a food crisis, prices of food went through the ceiling because all the companies that had invested in the subprime uh, property in the US realized this is collapsing, so they moved their money into food. And food became, became the hot investment. And if every level of investment requires 25% return, you can imagine how the food prices go up. So prices of dal, chawal, everything went up. And I, I remember the tur dal, the um, arar dal was selling at, 1, 000, uh, at 150 rupees a kilo. And suddenly we saw in the ration shops, which are the affordable price shops, a dal called ai dal. This was fascinating. Now why would a dal be called ai dal? You have tur dal, you have mung dal, you have urad dal, you have chana dal, you have all those dal. Why would it be called ai dal? I think it's a bit with this tech fascination. After all, Steve Jobs gave us the iPhone, the iPad, the <laughs> and they said, put an eye before dal and sell it. It wasn't a, a dal dal at all, you know. It was basically soya flour colored yellow. And again, the women wouldn't buy it. It was selling for 25 rupees, and the slum women weren't picking it up. They're saying, if we have to buy something for 25, we want it to be dal. This doesn't taste like dal. It doesn't cook like dal. We're not going to blow up 25 rupees on fake dal. But the sad thing is, the entire uh, food system, very, very rapidly, since food became a global commodity, with the writing of the WTO agreements and the GATT agreements, food has become a commodity, and the assumption is it doesn't matter how it was produced and what it is for. And that erasure of the links to nature and production and the use value and the consumption value, that erasure has created a whole new context around food which we didn't have before. Now, I got involved in these issues 87 when I was invited to a meeting where the big players were there talking about how they were going to right intellectual property rights laws into trade treaties through the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, which then became the WTO in 1995. In 95, as soon as WTO was established, a representative of Monsanto said, we wrote this treaty. We were the patient, the diagnostician, and the physician all in one. We defined a problem and offered a solution. And we took it to our government, which then took it to GATT and to the world. So what was the problem they defined? The problem they defined was that farmers save seeds. That's a problem. Now we see that as a solution. We see it as a solution for ecological adaption. 
We see it as a solution for economic self-reliance and seed sovereignty and seed freedom. We see it as a solution to keeping diversity of crops alive. Biodiversity conservation is, after all, a global obligation since 92, when the Convention on Biological Diversity was framed. But this was defined as a problem. And the solution was, now onwards, saving seed should be defined as a crime. The idea of intellectual property in seed and living systems was designed to criminalize an activity on which humanity's survival and agriculture has been based, seed saving. Now, this meeting of 87, the industry has said by the time 2000, we'll be five companies controlling all of food and all of health. Because the same companies were the agrochemical companies. They brought us the pesticides and the herbicides. Then they took seeds and adapted them to their herbicides, like Roundup Ready Soya, Roundup Ready Corn, so that they could sell more of the chemicals as well as the seed. But these same companies, particularly companies like Sieber, Geige, which became Novartis, then they became Syngenta. You know, they sell the toxics on the one hand, you get cancer, then they sell you the patented cancer drug, a big issue in India, the Novartis case. I won't go into its details. Who wrote the agriculture agreement of the WTO? Because it isn't that we didn't have international trade before. We had international trade. But agriculture was not part of international trade because every country realized it's vital to sovereignty. US, Europe had suffered during the war. And in that time, they'd created these victory gardens which were supp supplying 40% of the British food came from local gardens. 40% of the food in America came from local gardens. That's how they saw themselves through the war. They said, we must have our own food security, food sovereignty, food independence, food freedom. But between the end of the war and the 80s, a few players had become very big in the United States. Among them was Cargill, the world's biggest grain trader, a private company, which bought up the second biggest grain trader, Continental, in 2002, I think. The five big grain traders. For them, America was too small a market. And they needed to capture other markets. So the vice president of Cargill became the US lead negotiator for agriculture, he wrote the agriculture agreement. And the agriculture agreement has nothing to do with agriculture. It doesn't have the word soil, doesn't have the word food, doesn't have the word farmer. What it has is market access, exports, competition, and subsidies. And you might have followed the big debates right now in Bali, because the rich countries give $400 billion of subsidies, which should have been knocked out, but they've maintained it. And then they force small countries to open up their borders, which means that a very costly product can be highly subsidized and dumped destroying local production and the livelihoods of local farmers. I've witnessed it with the dumping of soya and the destruction of our mustard economy. $150 is the price, $190 the subsidy. When I started this work, Mexico, the source of corn for the world, was self-sufficient in its food. Today, they're importing 80% of their corn. Farmers destroyed, livelihoods destroyed, and countries that have large, small peasant populations, when those livelihoods are destroyed, there's nothing else you move to. You don't go from a farm to write software programs for IBM. It doesn't work that way. You go from the farm to a street. And I was in Mexico to help them deal with the fact that overnight, Monsanto wanted to plant GM maize on six million hectares. And of course, that land where the diversity of corn is still there, that would have been the end of that diversity. 
And they were talking to me about how more than 30% of Mexico's economy today is a crime economy. And that's something governments need to wake up to, that when you destroy honest livelihoods, the only economy that will grow is crime. So don't be surprised if there's more drug trafficking. Don't be surprised if there are more rapes. Don't be surprised if there's more killing of women. Don't be surprised if there's more kidnapping. This is a next step in this kind of economy. The third unprecedented move is the fact that A, people want to defend their livelihoods. B, people want to defend their freedoms. C, ordinary people want just decent food, food that tastes like food. Now, all of these freedoms are treated as an interference in trade. So now you have an amazing new threat to democracy and freedom through the process of globalization, which the most oppressive of feudal kings could not have dealt with because people would have risen. So the first freedom is, of course, the seed freedom. Now, in Nepal and India, we have the same root languages. Bija, ja is life. Bija is that from which life arises on its own forever and ever and ever. But Bija is also a metaphor for everything foundational. So when you say be Om, it's a Bija mantra. What is the Bija mantra? What is the Bija of anything? It is that which holds every other form. You know, every other sound. Again, come back to the issue of potential that I mentioned from quantum theory. So beach is that which holds the potential of every other unfolding. And see, freedom is then two freedoms. It is A, the freedom of the seed and therefore biodiversity and therefore evolution to evolve in freedom but it's also the foundational freedom for humanity. Because when you don't have that freedom, you have no other freedom. I've, you know, Henry Kissinger during the Vietnam War had said, we've got to use food as a weapon because when you control arms, you control governments. When you control food, you control people. And I've said when you control seed, then you control the earth. So what we witness very rapidly since the institutionalization of WTO, 95 onwards, is three tens in the seed sector. The first, of course, is the unleashing of GMOs. Did people ask for GMOs? Not in a single country. Every country there's been resistance. Why is the push for GMOs? Going back to that 1987 meeting, the industry said it very clearly. We want to patent life because that's where our profits will come because we'll be able to collect royalties. Because a patent is granted for an invention, something new you've created. And it gives you the right to exclude everyone else from making, selling, distributing the patented product. And it worked in industry so that if Sony's make a certain kind of camera, someone else wants to make a camera with those properties, they pay Sony a royalty and get the technology. But in the case of life, it's very different. First of all, putting a new gene doesn't create the life form. Yeah? Genetic engineering moves gene. The first patent on life was taken by General Electric through an Indian scientist who worked for General Electric, his name was Ananda Chakravarti. And this patent was the first genetically engineered organism. And when Chakravarti was asked, so you made something new, it's a patent. He says, no, I just shuffled genes around. I didn't make anything new. You know, you have uh, movers of, uh, of goods. I remember in the United States they have this whole chain called U-Haul. 
right? Now, U-Haul takes people's things from one house to the other when they move. This room, this morning was the breakfast room and someone moved the chairs. So suppose one of you had come with a chair, brought your own chair, because there were too few chairs. And then you turned around and said, I've brought a chair, therefore I designed and invented Hotel Shankar. And now the owners and proprietors of Shankar should pay me the rents for the use of Hotel Shankar. We laugh, you're laughing when it comes to chairs, but we allowed it to happen when it comes to life. Shuffling a gene allowed the ownership of life. All of the past evolution and all of the future evolution. So that's the first reason patenting of seed is wrong, because you don't invent the seed. The second reason it's wrong is, even when you move a gene, you move it into something. That something usually exists before. So for example, in India, we have this amazing debate on the BT Bengan. You remember? And a moratorium was put because we had public hearings, movements, our environment minister of that time, Jairam Ramesh, got a moratorium put. I just heard our current environment minister has just been removed also. The TV's been calling me from India to say, come and comment. I said, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm sitting in Nepal. Um, Janti Natarajan has just been removed, and they say, because she's inter interfering in growth. Problem is, when environmental protection is the work of the environment ministry, then that's the work that ministry has to do, not give fast clearances to ecologically destructive projects. But coming back to the Bengan, there's a case going on in India right now. The BT Bengan has been stopped in India. It's, they've allowed it in Bangladesh. There's a case going on that the bang unused, the eggplant used, had been pirated from India. So the second aspect of every patent on life is there's an element of piracy, because you've got to use existing things. You do, but since you don't create, you don't invent a bang -un. You move a gene into a bang -un. and that to a toxic gene that nobody wants. And the third aspect, of course, is you create a patent and you have a monopoly. And a monopoly in any field is disastrous, but a monopoly in seed, which is the basis of food production, is super disastrous. So I've basically said, because of this claim of inventing through doing genetic engineering, GMOs could be translated into God move over. You didn't do any creation. What? Shrishti kahanti? Hamne banai hai. The consequences of this, we have witnessed in India with BT cotton, the only genetically modified crop approved in 2002, four years after the entry of, by Monsanto of this crop, but they came in illegally. I had to sue them in the Supreme Court because we have a law on approvals of GMOs uh, under the Environment Protection Act of 86. It's called the Rules for Genetically Engineered Organisms and Hazardous Microorganisms, 1989. Um, and for four years, they weren't allowed to sell. But they had started to consolidate the cottonseed market in any case. Today, 60 Indian companies that have been breeders of cotton varieties have licensing arrangements which prevents them from selling anything but Monsanto's BT cotton. It, mysteriously, the public sector research institution, the Cotton Research Institution, has stopped releasing varieties. And this is something that happens worldwide. New York Times had a letter by plant breeders of America saying we are not able to breed. So public breeding disappears. Then the third source of seed is the farmer themselves. Why do they stop saving their own seeds and using their own seeds before patenting makes it illegal? There's something that is introduced which is called seed replacement, which is not a, it doesn't have any scientific basis. What it has is a basis, it has the Macaulay basis. I don't know how many of you know Macaulay. He was, uh, you know, the Britisher who went back to England after visiting India and said, you know, these guys are too prosperous. We can't colonize them. 
They have everything. They have more than we have. But the way we can take over economically is make them feel inferior about everything they have. And then let them feel everything that comes from England is superior. And then they'll buy our junk. Because everything that was being sold was junk. And in a way, the same thing is happening. Yeah? Your seeds are inferior. Buy this sort of improved variety. That's the very language. You know, farmers' varieties are called primitive varieties. What the companies bring are called improved varieties. And of course, you've seen it with toothpaste. You know, Colgate will keep bringing the next level of improved, 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 and you keep buying the next improved, improved, improved. And the same happens with blue jeans. They're all the same, and yet there's always the next design. I can't figure out, because it all looks the same to me. <laughs> a sari is different, but a blue jean is a blue jean. But you know, all my sisters in India, in the cities, in the big cities, have been sold this thing. The sari is primitive, and the blue jeans are modern. So with our fat hips, we are walking around in blue jeans. You know. I call my sari my six yards of freedom. <laughs> so farmers stop using their seed. Public sector disappears, the Indian companies become Monsanto. The price of seed jumps 8,000%. Monsanto representatives in public hearings before the Parliament of India in the Agriculture Committee admitted that the six, you know, there's a 450 gram package that's sold to farmers. And the reason it's 450 grams is because, you know, the Americans never grew up to use the metric system. So, the, you know, so the, the, that odd figure, 450, is because it translates straight from the American containers. 1,600 was the rate, of which 700 was royalty, going straight to St. Louis, Missouri. Now, in colonial times, we starved. We had the Great Bengal Famine, because revenues collected as rice was growing, going to England. And the women of Bengal started the movement in 1942, Jan Debo Dhan Debona. We will give our lives, we will not give our eyes. That triggered the Quit India movement, it triggered the independence thing, and everything else that India then inherited was a legacy of those movements. Land reform, fair prices to farmers, and affordable food for the rest. And that was the structure through which, after the Great Bengal Famine, which killed two million, India started to feed itself. We are being returned to those periods of super extraction of profits. Except that now it is not revenue from land, it is royalties from seed. So if then we had landlords, now we have global life lords. And as I mentioned, there are five. But there's one which controls 95% of the GM market. And the interesting thing is there's a new logic of trade has taken over. And that logic is basically, I love your hat. That hat should be mine. And if you stick to your hat, you're stealing from me. <laughs> so they've decided, OK, the calculations. And they did this in the 80s. I was part of that debate. It was called the seed wars in the FAO. They said, we can make a trillion dollars a year by forcing every farmer to buy seed in every season. So they fix their mind at one trillion. Now if the farmer says there should be seed sovereignty, or if a government says there should be seed sovereignty, that is treated as a theft of profits. And this in international trade treaties is now taking on the face of something called investor state suits, where corporations can sue governments for lost markets. Not that someone took a market away. Just as someone saved a river, yeah? someone saved health, someone saved education, someone saved seeds. The jump in price, the royalty extraction from farmers who have no money 
and buy the seed on credit has meant a debt trap of a scale we've never seen. And that indebtedness started to trigger farmer suicides from the cotton belt. But as other seeds start to get locked into the system where corporations supply the seed and the chemicals and then buy back a cheap commodity, it's happening with potatoes. I've just done an analysis for Bengal, where suddenly I heard um, potato farmers are in distress. You know, we pay two, you pay 20 rupees for that packet of chips that will give you nice diabetes, obesity, all the wonderful things that happen. <laughs> and the farmer for that 20 rupees gets 20 pies. Less than a percent goes to the farmer in industrial food, junk food systems. So, of course, the farmers were indebted. And earlier, when they were indebted to cooperative banks or public banks or extension systems, they would organize and say, Karz Mukti, because it was a public debt. Now it's a private debt. And you took it alone. And you're shamed because you thought your family would be prosperous because that's what was told to you, that there'd be higher yields, you'd have higher incomes, it would have miracle seed, and you don't have the face to go tell your wife that the money lender, which is the agent of the seed and chemical company, is breathing down my throat to grab our land. So the farmer will quietly go to the field and take on credit the last bottle of pesticide and drink it. And at least 90% cases of suicides of farmers are farmers drinking pesticide and their bodies by being found in the field. And my analysis is they love their land so much because it's their mother and they can't bear the party. So they go, end up ending their life. You know what the figure from 95 to now has, is, is? 284, 694, yeah? 2.8 lakhs. No, yeah, that's it, 2.8, more than a quarter million. You know, when 200 people are killed in ethnic violence, we call it ethnic cleansing. We call it a genocide. The WHO definition is very, very clear. The deliberate harm to any group, and they didn't say ethnic or religious, they said any group. A deliberate harm to any group by design. Now this is a deliberate harm. You've designed that you will make a seed monopoly. You've designed that you will make food farmers dependent. You've designed international laws to criminalize seed saving. These are not suicides, they are part of a genocide. And they will only end when we are able to reclaim our seed sovereignty, which is why Navdanya has started seed banks. You know, we, we create community seed banks to reclaim seed as a commons. And I started in 87, the minute I heard about all this, I stopped the work on Narmada, I stopped the work on Bhopal, and I just said, I'll just save seeds, I'll just save seeds. 110 community seed banks, we've started new ones about 10, eight years ago in the area where the highest suicides are. Uh, this is Vidharba in Maharashtra, where 95% cotton is now BT cotton. And we found old varieties of cotton and distributed them to farmer and taught them organic methods. And then we create small bits of fabric through Khadi, because after all, Gandhi had turned cotton into a fiber of freedom by spinning, and the spinning wheel was my inspiration to start Navdanya and the saving of seed. Because Gandhi has said the spinning wheel is powerful because it's so small that everyone can participate in freedom. And the seed is small, and everyone can participate in freedom, and not just farmers. We are now through the seed freedom movement saying every child, every mother, every school, Every religious institution should be part of defending the freedom of the seed and freedom of humanity. For those who want to see more, you can go to the website seedfreedom.in as well as the Navdanya website, which is navdanya.org. And we invite you to join this movement and sign the Declaration for Seed Freedom. Then you come to food freedom. So we've repeatedly been told the reason we need chemicals in the Green Revolution and GMOs now 
is because we get more food. And, you know, a billion people are hungry, there'll be nine billion soon, and you've got to feed them. Precisely because we have to feed them, we can't afford genetic engineering. Because genetic engineering has had a total failure to yield. There's been no increase. It can't. Because when you do a BT bengan, the BT gene doesn't add to the yield of this. The yield comes from the original plant material that was used, which is through conventional breeding or farmer's breeding. So genetic engineering nowhere has increased yield. It might have made the plant unstable and sometimes have what's called a yield drag, which we are seeing now with cotton in India and they're seeing in America with soya and corn. And the interesting thing is, in every one of these issues, it's the quality that matters. So in Punjab, the farmers are having a tough time because the wheat content of, uh, the protein content of wheat has declined so much that's not passing the test. Brazil, which has become only GM soya, the protein, because of genetic engineering, the protein content has declined so much that the Europeans are saying we won't buy your soya, it was not good enough. So we have to move beyond the Cartesian idea. A hundred years ago, we shed it in physics. A hundred years ago, we realized that the world is not made of hard, immutable balls. We just have weight, position, velocity. We realize everything has quality, everything has, is process, everything is in evolution. And because of that, the old, I would call it the Cartesian breeding, has given us mass and not food. So it's empty mass, you know. Wherever you don't have industrial breeding, a pear tastes like a pear. You get industrial breeding, the pear and the apple and the plum all taste alike. Because they're designed for Walmart trucks and Walmart ships. The poor South Africans had to change their apple because Walmart changed the size of its trucks. They said, your apples are the wrong size. And the issue of, you know, Diversity means you have all sizes and all shapes. You know, and cucumbers that are a little bent are fine. In the European Union, you can't sell a crooked cucumber. It's, it was rejected on sanitary and phytosanitary measures, which is the third treaty in WTO. A crooked cucumber has nothing to do with health. Part of it is, you know how they measure? They have these elite trays. If the Cucumber doesn't go through, throw it out. If the apple's too small, throw it out. If it's too big, throw it out. And that's why the market is now, our fields are monocultures and the markets are monocultures. 50% of the food in the industrial world, they keep pointing to the waste in our countries. And I say, Hamare desh mein kuch kharab nahi ho sakta. Kyunki wo gai hai na barabar mein. Wo sab kuch khati hai. You know? Food, everything is someone's food in our system, so there's no waste. That cabbage that rotted, you know, the cow will eat it quite happily. Or the compost, the earthworms love it. 50% of the food in the industrialized countries is wasted. 50% because of these standards of uniformity and long distance transport. But look at the data. The FAO released a report showing that 72% of the food that's eaten by people comes from small farms. 72%. So the majority food system is small farmer based. The remaining that is produced by industry is not food. 90% of the genetically modified corn and soya is used for biofuel to drive cars or as animal feed. This commodity system is not a food system. So we've got to, for food freedom and food democracy, we've got to return to a food system. And what are the qualities of food? It must nourish us. It must taste good. It must have flavor. It must fit into the culture and the processing of a particular kind of culture. All of that then defines food. Food is not about trade. Food is about nourishment, health, culture. 
It's about our relationship with the earth. And when food is treated as a commodity, you spray pesticides, 75% of the bees gone. You super irrigate, 75% of the water gone. You desertify the soils, 75% of the land on this planet is degraded. That's why they have a desertification and land deg degradation treaty under the United Nations. And 40% of the greenhouse gases come from an industrialized, globalized system of agriculture. Um, and that's what I analyzed in my book, Soil Not Oil. So coming back again and again to this idea, we need GMOs, we need chemicals, we need um, the Green Revolution and the Second Green Revolution to feed the world, it doesn't fit. And it doesn't fit, first, because at the systems level, you're producing less food. We've done a report called Health Per Acre. We're saying, if food is about health, then let's measure the nutrition. And farming systems based on diversity produce much more nutrition. We could be feeding two Indias with small farms based on biodiversity and ecological systems. Nepal could be feeding twice the population of Nepal. And in those systems, the uniqueness of the climate, the uniqueness of the soil becomes an advantage. In the monoculture industrial system, the mountains are a problem. They'd like to bulldoze it. <laughs> the Himalayas are too big to be bulldozed. So we'd better adapt to the Himalaya to create very special food systems. So when I started to save seeds, I remember the Mandua and Jangora, the millets, which you also have, they had stopped being eaten. No one knew anymore how to cook them, except women in rural areas. We saved the seeds, we started uh, promoting their marketing, and we call them forgotten foods. And these forgotten foods are foods of the future because they use very little water. For women who are overworked, they need nothing. They give you 40 times more nutrition. And they have as good as, you know, you can have too much rain, too little rain, the jangora and the mandua just stand there tall, like women. So the two little tricks that are paid repeatedly with manipulating our minds to not see this reality that biodiverse produces more, small produces more, ecological produces more, are the dominant use of the word yield. What does yield measure? Yield only measures a part of a part of a part of a part of a farming system. So you can impoverish your farming system and increase the output of one component and say, I got more. So let me give you a typical example. Nine units of biodiverse sources of food, beans, millets, oil seeds, four units of maize. No matter how much you pump chemicals, no matter what hybrids you bring, it'll go up to five. Yeah? By replacement. You take a nine unit and replace it all to a monoculture. From four, you go to five. And you say, wow, one unit more. I've saved the world from hunger. No one looks at the four units that disappeared. And those four units are the explanation of the growing malnutrition. Those four units of disappearance are the reason why even the poor are getting diabetes. It used to be called a lifestyle disease. It's a monoculture disease. Because biodiversity is not a luxury when it comes to how we produce. We need the diversity for resilience and adaptation. And it's not a luxury when it comes to eating. Because a monoculture diet of polished rice is going to give the poorest person diabetes. So we've got to bring diversity back into the equation. So yield is a measure. So we say not yield per acre, let's measure health per acre. And let's intensify those qualities. The second is technology in an abstract way. You know, here's a technology. I'm speaking into this mic. It's amplifying. My voice is reaching you. It's performing the function. Suppose this technology was such that it would only amplify to the level that you wouldn't hear my words and your ears would be drowned as if we are in a dancing club. Was, would it be performing the function of you listening to me? No, it wouldn't. So what is a technology? Technology is a tool. 
That's what it means. The word technique means a tool. What does a tool do? It takes some resources, modifies them for a particular need. So in any technology related to food, the resources are the soil, the biodiversity, the water, and the end product should be edible food that nourishes our bodies. If that technology is not producing more, and what it's producing is inferior in quality, full of toxics, no one wants it. If what's being produced doesn't solve the problems it claims to solve, of controlling pests and weeds, and instead of giving us super pests and super weeds, it's a failed tool. If you give me a spade, which is totally broken, and I can't lift anything with it, I will say, I'll find another. I'll find a workable one. Tools have to be compared to alternative methods and alternative technologies, and tools must get replaced when they fail. Sadly, the record of 20 years of commercial use of GMOs is that they have failed as a tool. They're not producing more, they haven't reduced chemical use, they've absolutely amplified chemical use. In India, we've done surveys in Vidarbha, 13 fold full more. In Argentina, 800% more. And that's the global. Everywhere there's an increase. And super pests and super weeds, half of America's farmlands are today overtaken by super weeds. And just last week, a new herbicide resistant crop was approved because Roundup is not controlling weeds. They're using Agent Orange 2,4-D that was sprayed on Vietnam. DuPont's 2,4-D resistant GMO has just been approved. Now, given all these issues, there is not just seed freedom and food freedom, but knowledge freedom also involved. After all, every person is a thinking being. And as a thinking being, we want to know what we eat. Why is the GMO industry so desperate to not allow people to know what's eaten? 40 billion was spent on California's ballot on GMO labeling, and another 40 billion was spent on Washington's GMO labeling ballot now. Why are they so scared about a simple label that's equivalent of a label that says this much salt, this much sugar, this much fat. If they're saying it's safe, they should be very happy with the label. It's because they know it's not safe, that they are scared of the label. And why do they know it's not safe? Their own studies have shown it. The first commercial product um, was RBGH, a, a bovine growth hormone, um, to inject human growth hormones into cows. Uh, genetically engineered uh, human growth hormone. And this meant that the cows, the feed would not be used by the cow to maintain its own body. It would be diverted to produce milk. The life of the cow was halved, but the production was increased 10%. But there were 42 new diseases. All this was known. They approved it. When this went to Canada, the scientists looked at the files and said the data, they didn't do new tests, they said this shows. We, we can't afford to approve it. Health Canada said no. You know what happened to the three scientists who said no? Government scientists all lost their jobs. They've become fe fellow warriors with us. In 1998, because of concern by the public, the UK government asked a very senior scientist called Dr. Arpad Putsai to do a study on GMO potatoes. He said, fine now. Now, Dr. Putsai thought GMOs were going to be a miracle. He was not looking for problems, but he found them. The brains had shrunk, the pancreas had expanded, and the intestinal system was totally damaged. He went to his director, and they went to BBC. Say, three-month rat studies do this damage, then the public should know. For one day, the BBC news was all over. Then the pressure started to build. Arpad Putsai was removed from his lab. His papers were taken away, and a gag order was put on him. We had to do a global campaign with the UK Parliament to get the gag order removed so he could at least talk. He had moved 
from the Soviet Union to England. He's gone back to Hungary. He said, I came to the West because I felt the Soviet Union curtailed my freedom. But I find there is no freedom anymore in the West either in these particular spheres. So I go back and do independent research. Of course, there was a lot of damage. He had a stroke. He suffered a lot. Seralini used to be a UK regu uh, French regulator. And when the data from Monsanto came to him, he realized how sloppy the studies were. So he decided to go back to university and do a very thorough study for his own information. Two years. No feeding studies for two years. And usually they're three months. Did the study. A journal called the Journal for Food and Chemical Toxicology published it. And if, for those who are scientists or any academic knows, peer-reviewed journals mean 20 people have read it and said, yes, it's sound. It gets published. And immediately the attacks start. And the journal writes back and puts an editorial saying, we've looked at the study again, and it's fine. We're not going to withdraw it. Anyway, studies don't get withdrawn. They get countered. If you're so smart, write another paper. Then Monsanto puts its own man as editor for biotechnology, Goodman. And they carry on the pressure. And a few weeks ago, Seralini's paper is retracted. Not done in human history and the history of science. Retraction of papers. So the freedom of science is suffering. And with destroying the Arpat Putsai and the Seralini, and these studies very few people can do. It takes a long time, a lot of money. If you silence the 20 people who are capable of doing this research and say, no proof of safety, is that science or is it a fraud? But there's another aspect on which knowledge sovereignty and knowledge democracy is being attacked. Now, I'm a quantum physicist, but I've looked long enough at life sciences to recognize that the idea that genes are immutable, balls, you take them from here, you take them there, they'll express the same thing, and everything is predictable, is not true. The same gene can give different expressions. Many genes give the same expression. There's now a new field which every scientist recognizes is really the way we should look at, genet at genes, which is called epigenetics, above the gene, beyond the gene. Because they're realizing you could have the same genes, same cells, in a Petri dish, and you, if you put different medium, different expressions take place. Different things happen. So the environment has an impact on how genes express. The genes are not immutable. Determinate billiard balls. They are part of a living interaction which defines the expression. So an outmoded paradigm is being used on something as vital as seed and food, which is the reason you, you thought you would control weeds, you get super weeds. You thought you'd control pests, you get super pests. Nothing is working. And finally, the issue is how, what about the public? They're journals, they're scientists. But there's also the public. I mentioned the whole issue of labeling, but there's another aspect where you bombard, you, you, you've just taken these five people and you just take them around the world because you've got huge amounts of money and knowledge has been replaced by propaganda and repetition of the mantra without evidence, we feed the world, we feed the world, we feed the world, GMOs are safe, GMOs are safe, GMOs are safe. Now, the least that we need is a knowledge democracy. Let different kinds of knowledge flourish. Let there be debates, free, open debates. Let people decide with all of that knowledge. And that is why at Navdhania, <coughs> we work on the freedom related to seed, freedom related to food, and freedom related to knowledge. And rela freedom related to knowledge particularly touches on countries like ours, which have had a biodiversity economy and very rich knowledge of biodiversity. Give you just two very quick examples. There's something called golden rice they've been trying to introduce in 2000. When they started it, it was going to get 
34 micrograms of vitamin A equivalent, supposed to prevent blindness. And the UK Secretary of Agriculture has just said anyone questioning golden rice is killing two million babies. 34 micrograms compared to things like carrots. You know, why do we call the precursor carotene? Because, because of carrots. Coriander, curry patta, uh, amaranth leaves, 1,400 units compared to 34. And we are being told that 34 is more? The latest is the GM banana. Now, take a guess what they're genetically engineering banana for. Hmm? No. Iron. Now, iron has... Uh, banana has 0.44 milligrams of iron. Let me just read out. Things we use in our everyday. Amaranth, 11. Moringa, you know, the sedgeon tree? <coughs> 28. Buckwheat, 15. Neem, 25. Horse gram, 6.8. Bengal gram leaves, 23. Tamarind pulp, 17. Poppy seeds, 15, turmeric 67, 0.44. We were talking about 3,000, 7,000 percent inferior performance. That too is knowledge colonization. You come back, terra nullius, bio nullius, and now empty heads. We don't have heads, we don't have minds. Now, when all of this combines together, the meaning of freedom around these issues. becomes a survival imperative. Because so far freedom has been civil rights, how can I speak my view? Now it is, will you please let us live? The freedom to stay alive. That's what we are talking about. And I'm so grateful that I came to know of all this early enough to be able to build the alternatives, build Navdanya. We now offer a course every September comprehensive course on the A to Z of ecological agriculture, on the soil, on the seed, on the food, on the trade, on the economics, on the everything. And I hope some of you will come to Navdanya in the Herodun and join us. But I hope more than that, that my visit here will trigger a new partnership at the level of farmers, at the level of researchers. And for anyone who tries to tell you genetic engineering is about those who can shoot genes, it's also about social science. It's also about anthropology. It's also about politics. It's also about economics. It's about culture. It's about everything. Everyone needs to be engaged in the movements for seed freedom, food freedom, knowledge freedom, because everyone gets their food from seed. And all of us must have independent minds that can think for ourselves. That's how independent countries are born, as Tagore had said you know, in his beautiful poem, the mind is without fear and knowledge is free. That's what we need to rebuild again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiva, for this wonderfully uh, stimulating lecture. I can be quite certain that this has uh, certainly given us a lot of food for thought, with the pun intended. Uh, after a delivery of this kind, one is best placed not to comment on it. Uh, and I'd like to invite the gathering to join us for tea in the next room. But here I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, the two organizations that helped uh, support this uh, event, the Alliance for Social Dialogue and Buddha Air. And we look forward to continued support in the years to come. I'd also like to thank the audience for turning out in such numbers this afternoon. And of course, Dr. Shiva, once again, thank you. Uh, we, we have uh, copies of her printed lecture uh, being distributed as you exit. So please make sure you pick up a copy. And Dr. Shiva is going to be here throughout the tea period to interact with. Thank you again.